North Korea through a jurist's eye. My name is Katie Young, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished jurist, the Honorable Michael Kirby. In this series, we've had a long line of legal visionaries, including Amartya Sen, Jürgen Habermas, Frank Michaelman, and Nicola Lacey, to name just a few. And we've heard these scholars speak with profound insights about the law. Yet it would be fair to say, I think, that none have implemented their insights in such direct service to law as our speaker today. Michael Kirby has advanced our thinking and our knowledge about human rights, about justice and the law through his scholarly writings, but also in the judgments he has delivered and the reports he has completed. A very truncated biography highlights this contribution. Michael Kirby was Justice of the High Court of Australia from 1996 to 2009. This is the equivalent to the US Supreme Court. When he retired from the High Court, he was Australia's longest serving judge. And in that extraordinary period of service, he penned significant reasons, including significant dissents that continue to guide the development of Australia's law in justice seeking directions. He has served as president of the International Commission of Jurists and accepted a number of international appointments with the United Nations, as well as the Commonwealth Secretariat, the OECD, and the Global Fund Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. He continues to work on issues related to human rights, to LGBTQI rights, to animal welfare, to the arts, to HIV AIDS, and the global right to health. He has received more prizes, honorary degrees, and honors than I can count. If I started to list them, I think we would be here until the evening. In his, it's his appointment by the UN Human Rights Council to head the Commission of Inquiry on the alleged human rights violations in the Dem Democratic People's Republic of Korea from 2013 to 14 that he will speak about today. I had the great fortune to serve as clerk for Justice Kirby in 2001, a year in which I could see how an extraordinary work ethic, he's, he's justifiably famous for it, and a far-thinking world vision can affect change through the law. He is a heroic jurist, and we are deeply honored to have him with us today. Please welcome Michael Kirby. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Katie, for that uh, somewhat biased um, presentation of me. I expected no less, and uh, I uh, enjoyed my participation with you in your class this morning on uh, international health care, uh, which is another area in which uh, I have been involved. Uh, now, there's a lot to say about North Korea, and it's a very timely uh, meeting that we have to talk about it, given uh, the uh, many developments that have been happening in uh, the Korean Peninsula and the region uh, in the last uh, few months. Um, but I want to thank uh, the uh, Klo Center and uh, Chuck Klo for the opportunity to come to Boston College. This is my first visit to uh, Boston College and I'm especially glad to be here uh, with my former clerk, uh, Katie Young. The uh, Commission of Inquiry on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, DPRK, North Korea, uh, was established uh, by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. Uh, it was established without a vote. That is a very unusual, indeed unique thing to happen. Creating a commission of inquiry for the United Nations uh, involves ratcheting up the response of the, uh, of the um, United Nations system to the uh, problems of human rights in a country. And usually it's very hard fought. The president of the council, uh, who was the then ambassador of Poland, uh, waited uh, and called the matter three times to see if there was a call for a vote, but there was no call for a vote. 
And that was because of the fact that over the uh, 10 years or so before that, uh, there was a constant stream of complaints uh, and of testimony and evidence that led to the decision to create uh, the inquiry uh, and to establish it at a high level. Uh, ten years earlier, the Human Rights Council had created a special rapporteur on the human rights situation in North Korea. The original special rapporteur was Professor Vitit Munterborn of Thailand, uh, and the second special rapporteur was uh, Mr. Mazuki Darasman, who was the uh, former Attorney General and Prosecutor General of Indonesia. Um, neither of those mandate holders was permitted to enter North Korea, and North Korea refused to have anything to do with them or their mandate. Uh, and so when the commission was established, by the terms of the resolution, uh, the special rapporteur was a member of the commission, uh, and one other member was appointed, Sonia Biserko, who was a leader in civil society in Serbia and an expert on genocide. And we three uh, met for the first time in uh, July 2013 in the Palais Wilson, named after President Wilson on the banks of uh, the lake in Geneva. Uh, and we uh, decided uh, on our methodology and we then stuck to it. Uh, we brought our report in uh, on time, uh, within budget and unanimously. And the report, when it was delivered, created something of a sensation in Geneva because we had gone about our task in a way that was different from all other commissions of inquiry uh, and different from the way the UN normally conducts uh, such matters. Uh, the um, topic for my talk to you is a jurist looking at uh, North Korea. One can speak about many aspects uh, of the regime, about the history, about its origins, uh, uh, about the psychology uh, of the regime of the Kim dynasty in North Korea, but that is not the focus of this discussion today. I'm going to talk uh, about looking at North Korea from the point of view of a lawyer and looking at uh, the problem of investigating North Korea from the point of view of a lawyer. And I'm going to isolate 10 issues which uh, involve a lawyerly examination of the problem of human rights uh, in North Korea. Uh, North Korea uh, was established immediately after the Second World War. It was not created by the uh, decision of the people of North Korea. Uh, it was created uh, by the decision of the Allies um, who were then approaching the end of the Second World War. At a meeting in Cairo, it was decided that the Japanese colony in Korea uh, should be uh, divided with a Soviet sphere of influence in the north and an American sphere of influence in the South. The actual line that divided the two spheres was drawn in the State Department of the United States, in Washington, uh, by a middle-ranking official, uh, Dean Rusk, who was later Secretary of State for President Kennedy. Uh, he had never been to Korea, didn't know anything about Korea, but the division was imposed and uh, regimes were established in both sides of the uh, line, which were uh, autocratic uh, and uh, oppressive. If the Klo Center is a study of uh, elected electoral democracy, then neither of the two Koreas at that stage was an electoral democracy. The um, South, ultimately evolved into an electoral democracy and we've seen it at work in recent days by the application of the Constitution 
uh, by orders of the Supreme Court, which led to the impeachment of President Park and her removal from office. And at the time we're meeting, she is in prison uh, awaiting trial for crimes relating to uh, the impeachment. Uh, but in the North, the law uh, does not reign. Uh, the North is an absolute monarchy. Uh, the will of the Supreme Leader uh, and of the family and elite around him prevails. There is a framework of a constitution, but as I will go on to describe, it's not a law uh, respecting state. It does not abide by the rule of law. The first lawyerly decision we had to make was how we would conduct the inquiry. The usual way the UN uh, investigates in a commission of inquiry or through the special rapporteur mandate uh, is by uh, the methods of the civil law tradition of Europe. Uh, these tend to work in private uh, to be quite efficient uh, but they don't follow the Anglo-American Anglo uh, tradition of transparency uh, and openness. Um, when we met, I suggested to my colleagues, and they agreed, that an investigation of North Korea should provide the antidote to the secrecy uh, of the regime and that we should conduct our inquiry by public hearings uh, we should invite the media to be present. Uh, we, we should uh, film uh, those witnesses uh, whom it was safe to film. Uh, and we should put the film online and make it available to the whole world. Uh, that was the way by which we decided we would um, proceed in a very open fashion. The United Nations resisted that methodology. They said they didn't have the security forces to protect us, uh, that uh, people would come and disrupt the hearings, that uh, it was not a wise way to go about things. Uh, we rejected all of these uh, objections and we proceeded to uh, act in a very open fashion. Uh, tonight, if you haven't had enough uh, in this address, you can Google the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea and you can sit there for hours and hours, days, watching the testimony that unfolded before us in Seoul, in Tokyo, in London and in Washington DC where we had hearings as well as in Geneva. Uh, this methodology proved to be extremely powerful uh, because one of the problems um, of dealing with human rights in North Korea is that you can't get into the country. We never expected to get in as they wouldn't cooperate with the special rapporteurs. They were hardly likely to cooperate with us um, who were a step up in the procedures of the United Nations. Uh, and so um, the testimony which we received then became um, the source of the writing of the report. In the Anglo-American tradition, uh, when you write uh, the opinion or, of a court or you write uh, the reasons of a public inquiry, it's not at all uncommon that you then include in the document extracts from the testimony of witnesses. The value of that is that you allow the witnesses and the people who are the subject of the abuse to uh, speak for themselves. And if in the end of our project we did nothing else but allow the uh, people who had suffered, who came before us in great numbers, uh, to speak uh, and then use their testimony on every second page of our report, uh, that was a respect for them that they had not received from their own country or from any other inquiry up till that time. Uh, and it was a way of showing that the United Nations system was taking the complaints of the people who are coming before us um, seriously. Uh, we had no difficulty securing witnesses. We advertised for them. They came forward in large numbers 
In the end, we had to cut off the witnesses because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to complete our report effectively within six months uh, of the commencement of the inquiry. Uh, and uh, so the first legal decision was methodology. Methodology is very important uh, and it's important to the common law but it's also important to UN inquiries and I think uh, the uh, power of our report stems from the fact that, that we did it in this unusual and different way and I believe that uh, there are lessons for that in the conduct of UN uh, commissions of inquiry of which there are many. There are many books coming out now about commissions of inquiry of the United Nations and I'm glad that our commission was done before those books were printed because I know from reading manuscripts that this has been a major matter of controversy and discussion. <coughs> Secondly, <coughs> we had to proceed with due process. Uh, there's no protocol for the UN uh, commissions of inquiry, but due process it has always been a central obsession of the common law. So much so that people looking at the common law system say <coughs> that we are so obsessed with doing it the right way that we forget the object of doing the right thing at the end of it. Uh, procedure is very important. And so we conducted our procedure with great care uh, to offer North Korea every uh, aspect of procedural fairness. We contact them at their mission of the United, to the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, we talked um, uh, with their uh, officials, but uh, they would not receive us. We were not surprised. Uh, but we continued to advise them of our hearings, of our meetings. We persuaded the Republic of Korea, that's South Korea, to agree uh, to permit them to hire a lawyer or to send a lawyer from North Korea to appear before the Commission. Uh, and uh, we signified that, but they did not take that opportunity. <laughs> Uh, we uh, wrote our report and then at the end when we had completed the writing of the report uh, I insisted that it should be sent in copy to the Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un uh, uh, Kim Jong uh, Un, uh, to um, consider whether or not he wanted to make factual uh, comments or corrections or uh, make corrections uh, with comments of his own but they ignored that. Uh, when uh, I wrote to him, I wrote a letter which is in the uh, appendix to the report in which I pointed out that under international law, um, in respect of uh, crimes against humanity, uh, there is a command principle, that is that a person who is in command uh, and has the power to restrain officials below him or her and fails to do so and thereby allows the crimes against humanity to continue, that person may themselves be liable for the crimes that follow. And in my letter to him, I pointed this rule out and said <coughs> that uh, the officials of North Korea, comma, including possibly yourself, comma, will be responsible for the crimes identified <coughs> in the report, uh, seeking thereby to persuade him to take part in the inquiry, but uh, he refused. Uh, the uh, report uh, also um, observed due process by continuing to contact China China uh, and Russia, uh, the Russian Federation, have borders with North Korea uh, and uh, very large numbers of refugees were escaping from North Korea into China, some into Russia, some into Mongolia. Uh, and uh, in respect of them, 
the ones in China, they had to live a, a covert secret life and uh, if detained by officials, there was a protocol in force between DPRK and China by which they were sent back to China. Uh, we asked to uh, go to China to speak to Korean refugees in the borderland uh, and also to go to Beijing to speak to government officials and to the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees in China uh, and that was politely refused. Uh, China uh, continued to assert that the people coming from North Korea into China were economic refugees uh, and that it had a perfect right to stop them and to send them back. Uh, we drew their attention <coughs> to the principle of reformant uh, and to the principle of international refugee law, which uh, is the so-called rule of being a refugee sur plus. That is to say, somebody who might have left the country of their nationality for reasons uh, of economics, but who, finding themselves liable to punishment uh, and to um, uh, oppression uh, if they were sent back can turn into a <coughs> refugee and be entitled to protection as a refugee. We drew this to the attention of China but it didn't change their mind and China did not cooperate and at every stage uh, voted against uh, the implementation of the report. Uh, the Commission kept in mind that we were not a court and we were not a uh, prosecutor. It was important for us to take that differentiation because of the fact that people who have been judges, in my experience, often find it difficult to forget that they have been judges and think they're still judges. Well, we had not forgotten that and uh, we uh, consistently pointed out that our job was to find facts. We were a fact-finding commission. We were a commission of inquiry. Inquiry was our obligation. Uh, we were not there to uh, put North Korea on trial, nor to exercise the prosecutor's discretion and say they must be on trial. Our job essentially was to find facts uh, present the evidence on the facts to express clearly the findings that we made and then uh, to uh, suggest if we thought it should go further that it should be examined by a nominated prosecutor. Uh, and all of that involved a legal analysis of the testimony. Uh, we also had to have a very clear conception of what the principle was uh, binding on us for the making of the findings. Um, if we had been a court, then under United Nations inquiry rules, we would have had to apply the criminal standard of proof, proof beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, however, given that our inquiry was to find the factual foundation for a possible later prosecution, uh, we applied the United Nations principle, uh, which was, <coughs> were there reasonable grounds to believe that the testimony that we had amounted to a relevant international crime? Uh, of course, if you don't have a contradictor, if North Korea refuses to send someone to speak for itself, uh, then either the the tribunal, um, in this case the Commission of Inquiry, had to appoint somebody to speak for North Korea or the Commission had to do that job itself. We assumed the obligation on the latter and we examined witnesses in order to uh, ascertain as far as we could the truth. Overwhelmingly, we were convinced that the people who were coming forward were telling the truth. Um, uh, of course, a long experience in the courts as a judge for 34 years had 
shown to me that people don't always tell the truth. Therefore, you have to have a degree of scepticism and uh, examination, including self-examination, when you're making findings. Um, in one case, uh, a witness named Shin, uh, North Korea subsequently was to discover his father in North Korea, who then went on television uh, claiming that Shin had told a pack of lies and that he was always an imaginative child and this is just part of his uh, falsehoods and he should come back home and throw himself at the feet of the Supreme Leader and beg forgiveness and acceptance by his country. Um, it later turned out, Shin acknowledged, that he had exaggerated some aspects, uh, though the substance of his uh, testimony he adhered to. And um, his, his testimony was not critical to the report. There was much other testimony along similar lines. There was corroboration of the broad outlines of most of the testimony, uh, and it was a powerful uh, and indeed overwhelming case, even in the evidence that we were able to ex um, extract from the witnesses, um, who, as I say, we had to cut off in order that we would get through the job. Uh, the um, other issues of law that we had to consider related to the offences that were involved. Obviously because the mandate came from the um, Human Rights Council, uh, we were expected to examine human rights questions and we were given uh, a 10 point mandate uh, and our report is divided so that we deal with different chapters with each of those aspects of the mandate. Uh, the mandate on movement or lack of movement within the country and overseas. The mandate on detention camps. The mandate on uh, prison camps, the ordinary prison system. Uh, the mandate on food and the starvation which uh, undoubtedly killed between uh, 800,000 and more than a million people in the mid-1990s during a famine. Uh, the minda mandate on the treatment of women. Uh, the mandate on the refugees and refugees turned into uh, trafficked women. The mandate on women who were forced to drown their babies uh, being brought back into China uh, because of the fact that the baby had been fathered by a Hun Chinese um, uh, national. Uh, the mandate on religion, uh, the treatment of people for religion, the mandate on the Songbun system. Songbun was a classification of the people into social classes. Uh, there were more than 50 categories and it was very difficult unless you became a member of the elite to get out of the category into which you were classified at birth. Uh, and the mandate dealing with abductions, uh, abductions of very large numbers of uh, uh, prisoners of war who were seized during the Korean War and not returned despite the armistice agreement, uh, and the mandate relating to the abduction of Japanese and other nationals. The interference of North Korea in foreign countries is a flagrant breach of international law respecting the sovereignty of uh, nation states and the latest example of that which was not at all surprising to those who had read our report was the murder at the airport in Kuala Lumpur of King uh, Jong Nam, the half-brother of the present Supreme Leader. So all of those were the matters that we went through and we made our findings. Uh, there were countless uh, human rights violations and these are described in the report. But there were also two other categories of human rights violations which are uh, in the United Nations, um, um, under United Nations law, very serious breaches of human rights. Um, 
First, there were the crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity was developed uh, at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg and at Tokyo after the Second World War. A crime against humanity is a crime of violence pursued uh, as a matter of state policy uh, which uh, shocks the conscience of mankind, as it was put in those days, it shocks the conscience of humanity. Um, and uh, we also had to examine the evidence in relation to alleged genocide. Genocide was alleged uh, on the basis of the treatment of people, uh, it, especially in the detention camps, uh, because of the practice uh, of North Korea, uh, where a person is sent to a detention camp um, of uh, detaining uh, the person uh, alleged together with children and together with their parents. The idea being to remove from society uh, the uh, scourge of the uh, disaffected so that uh, the society is freed from that um, uh, infection. Uh, <coughs> the uh, crimes against humanity were easy to, to detect. There were many of them and they are listed in our report. Uh, genocide <coughs> presented a particular problem. The Genocide Convention of 1948 um, describes the crime of genocide relevantly as involving crimes of violence, including homicide, uh, committed as a result of state practice, uh, which um, in, is done on the basis of race, nationality, ethnicity or religion. Now the problem with North Korea was that the reason for the crimes uh, was not race or religion. It therefore didn't fall into the two categories which had been identified at the end of the Second World War, largely by reference to the crimes of the Nazis uh, and the matters that had motivated those crimes. Genocide is killing a, a population or portion of a population for reasons of race, ethnicity, nationality or religion. Um, we, were, uh, we were minded to think that today genocide in ordinary understanding extends to killing people, a population, on re for reasons of political views. If you look at Cambodia, for example, a country in respect of which I held an earlier mandate for the United Nations, um, the, the uh, victims of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia were likewise killed, not because of their race or their religion, but because of their political allegiance or suspected political allegiance. Uh, however, uh, we consulted a number of experts, including Professor Shabas, William Shabas, who's an expert on uh, genocide, and Shabas said, uh, he pointed to the history of the Genocide Convention and the endeavour at that time to get political opinion included in the grounds of the genocide, but that was resisted at the time by the United States of America and it didn't go in. And as a result of that, whilst adding a note to the effect that the members of the Commission believed that it was possible that genocide had expanded in its understanding in, uh, in uh, the common use of mankind to include political opinion, um, we didn't have to go that far because finding crimes against humanity is already a very serious crime and demands the response of the international community. So we did not find genocide and we explained why we did not. Uh, we did find uh, the affront to the sovereignty of Japan in the numbers of Japanese nationals who were seized and taken to North Korea, often for reasons that was very were very difficult to uh, uh, fathom. Uh, one young girl was coming home from badminton, her parents waiting her for her to arrive, 
and she was seized, put on a boat, um, rowed out to another boat and taken to North Korea where uh, she was raised and apparently uh, used for the purpose of teaching modern Japanese idiom that could be used by uh, people coming from North Korea into Japan uh, as uh, spies and agents of uh, North Korea. So uh, having completed our report, uh, we then had to decide how to advance the actions of the Commission of Inquiry. Um, there was no uh, special tribunal established for North Korea, uh, as had been done in the case of uh, the former Yugoslavia and in the case of Rwanda. Uh, and the mood for creating such a special tribunal um, was probably not there uh, at the moment. Um, but uh, the International Criminal Court had been established and it had a jurisdiction which uh, would be entirely suitable for uh, trying the crimes of uh, North Korea as found on a reasonable probability basis in our report. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, we looked to the Rome Statute, which has an exceptional provision. In most cases, the International Criminal Court secures its jurisdiction from a decision uh, of the country concerned to become a party to the Rome Statute. And many countries have become parties to the Rome Statute, including the Republic of Korea, South Korea, but not North Korea. Unsurprisingly, North Korea has not submitted to itself to that jurisdiction. Uh, however, there is an exceptional provision by which the permanent five concurring, the Security Council can refer the uh, matter to the International Criminal Court. Uh, and so um, we recommended that uh, the matter should be referred to a prosecutor of the International Criminal Court with a view to um, the <coughs> prosecutor finding whether there were crimes uh, of the kind that would fall within the jurisdiction. So far, no um, motion has been put before the Security Council for that purpose, um, presumably because uh, of, of the feeling uh, on the part of the Western countries that uh, China and the Russian Federation would veto such a referral. Um, an indication that that was probably a correct assessment arose just before our report uh, was uh, released to the Security Council uh, when we held an ARIA meeting. An ARIA meeting is a procedure that has been developed in the practice of the Security Council by which if, if parties want to put a matter before the Security Council, they can offer a briefing. It's named after Mr ARIA who devised this technique <coughs> and all of the members of the Security Council uh, in 2014 came along to the meeting except the Russian Federation and China. The Russian Federation made the point of calling on us to explain that their objection was not to the findings of the Commission of Inquiry but to country specific human rights inquiries. They had no complaint about what we did uh, but uh, they just didn't agree with that form of inquiry. I suggested to them that we had nothing to do with the creation of the Commission of Inquiry and now that they had our report they could not make it just disappear and it did enliven their consideration as a member of the Security Council. Uh, however, they said that they just didn't agree with country specific mandates and that was it. That was basically the response of the friends of North Korea in the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly and the Security Council. Um, so uh, that is where it stands at the moment. The Security Council unusually uh, had a debate about North Korea following our report. Uh, it is the only country other than Myanmar, Burma, that has resulted in a resolution 
placing the matter on the agenda of the Security Council. Um, the report was adopted uh, in the Human Rights Council by an overwhelming vote, the strongest vote of any human rights investigation in the Human Rights Council. Likewise, it was adopted in the General Assembly with the strongest vote. Uh, uh, it was uh, overwhelming. Uh, it was 121 uh, countries in favour of the report, uh, 19 countries against the report, and 56 countries abstaining. Uh, but uh, in the Security Council, in the Charter of the United Nations, there's a little noticed provision uh, which uh, was borrowed from the Covenant of the League of Nations, uh, which uh, says that uh, a procedural resolution can be adopted by uh, a vote of 10 members <coughs> of, the, uh, of the Security Council. Uh, and there were certainly 10 members. In fact, in the end, there were 11 members voting in favour of the report and that procedural motion was what put the report on the agenda of the Security Council, where it can be enlivened by a substantive motion at any time. Meantime, the Security Council has uh, twice in the last year adopted strong and increasingly strong sanctions against DPRK as a result of their con conduct of uh, nuclear weapon tests. Uh, North Korea had been a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but it, uh, it denounced the treaty and removed itself from the treaty. Um, and North Korea is the only state in the world that has conducted nuclear tests in this 21st century. So um, the uh, political situation that is now arising uh, is pretty clear. Uh, it is that nothing will be done about North Korea, that um, something will be done to increase the sanctions uh, or otherwise to make um, it difficult for North Korea short of war, or that some form of war strike will be made against North Korea, um, which uh, unless it is in self-defence of the country making the strike, would be outside the requirements of the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, these are decisions which are being considered <coughs> even as we meet. I was in Washington DC two weeks ago for a conference organised by the American uh, Enterprise Institute um, and uh, there was a lot of discussion about what should be done. Of course, the media is full of discussion about what should be done. Uh, but um, <coughs> what we all have to understand is that North Korea is now already a country with 20 nuclear warheads. They are increasingly being developed uh, in miniature size. You will remember that the problem with the atomic bomb uh, was its size uh, it, uh, and when it was dropped over Hiroshima it was called the big one because it was very big. Getting these things down to a size uh, suitable for an intercontinental rocket is uh, a scientific and technological challenge but North Korea last year conducted 24 missile tests, most of them uh, in the sea aimed in the direction of Japan, their former colonial master. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that North Korea represents a very serious uh, danger to peace and security uh, in its region and in the world. Uh, but it's also a danger to universal human rights because anyone who thinks you can have a nice little tight nuclear war in the Korean Peninsula, first of all writes off the city of Seoul, uh, which is only a hundred kilometres away from uh, launching sites in North Korea, uh, and also writes off the modelling that has been done of nuclear 
warfare uh, which demonstrates that the immediate effects of even a limited contained nuclear war are so horrendous from the point of view of the destruction uh, and death that would result uh, and so um, substantial in relation to the effects on the biosphere and the environment of the uh, area and the planet that uh, we cannot think of a contained nuclear war and therefore nuclear weapons basically are only useful to the extent that you don't use them. Uh, so this is the situation that we've arrived at. At least it does make us all concentrate and focus our minds on something which a person of my age uh, has been thinking about since 1945, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, until now, we've thought of um, the global uh, warming uh, and uh, global poverty as the big global issues, but nuclear weapons are swimming back into our consciousness and the challenge of dealing with human rights which includes the right to life and the right to life of the people on the Korean Peninsula um, is uh, very much in the minds of anybody who had anything to do with the Commission on Human Rights Violations in North Korea. Uh, so that's what I came to tell you about it. I'm sorry it can't have an immediately happy ending. Hopefully one day it will have a happy ending. After all, the people of North Korea are just men, women and children like the rest of us. Uh, and uh, they didn't choose the division of their country and the imposition of this division which has led to this uh, standoff, which has never been settled. The Korean War was not settled by a peace treaty, it was settled by an armistice. So it's a temporary settlement still in place. War is still notionally uh, existing between the two Koreas. Uh, and the position has now become very complicated by the rapid advance in the nuclear armaments uh, of the uh, North Korea uh, and its implications for uh, the Korean Peninsula and indeed for all of us. So uh, that's what I came to tell in this GLO lecture. I hope you think it was worthy of your attention for an hour.